speaker is Dan Turner Evans, who comes to us from Genelia, and he is going to talk to us about yet a different organism right now. So I think this has been a great session for diversity. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you here today. So I work in the Gyromon Lab at Genelia, where we try to understand the neural computations that underlie navigation behaviors in the fruit fly. So let me start off by describing um, a fascinating navigation behavior in insects. I'm a little frozen here, so let me replug. Um, so ants, bees, and many other species are capable of uh, path integration. It's just not changing slides, yeah. So um, these species can start at their nest or their hive and go out foraging. They can wander for long distances, say tens of meters, um, all over the place. And eventually, if they find food, they're then able to travel in a straight line uh, directly back to their nest or directly back to their hive. Uh, and a number of fascinating experiments have shown that they can remember uh, both the angular heading with respect to their home as well as the distance, and so that they're storing some kind of internal homing vector. And so theories from um, you know, over a couple decades ago suggested that, yeah, it just doesn't change slides. Um, theories from over a couple decades ago suggested that you could store this type of information in two different ways. You could store the angular heading um, in a sort of angular integrator, much like the head direction cells we heard about earlier. And you could store the distance in some kind of linear distance integrator. There we go. All right, so here we have an example of path integration, and that would be stored with angular heading and uh, angular heading integrator and linear distance integrator. So this was the ant. We work in the fly. Do flies do anything like path integration? Um, so this, for this, we can turn to um, some recent data from the literature. This is from Murad et al., Irene Kim, and Michael Dickinson, and we've replicated their experiments in our lab. So this is the fly that's been starved for a couple of days and placed in an arena in the dark and then allowed to explore freely. And in the center of this arena, I've placed an odorless drop of sucrose. That's the red dot. I just put that there so that you can see where the food is. The fly can't see that. So the fly wanders around and explores and eventually finds the food. So what's interesting is what happens after the fly has eaten for a little while. So the fly now will continue to explore, but its behavior is noticeably changed. So it does these tight loops, it stays close to the food, and it often returns. So it does some kind of local search behavior, and it seems to be remembering the location of the food, similar to how the ant remembers the location of the nest. So this is something like path integration. So flies can uh, do some approximation of path integration. Is there any indication that they have an angular heading integrator or can track distance in the brain? Well, the answer to the heading question is a definitive yes. This is work done from a couple years ago by Johannes Seleg, who was then a postdoc in the lab. And he looked at a number of neurons that arborize in this structure known as the ellipsoid body. That's the green disk labeled as the EB up there. And this is what the arborizations of those neurons look like. This is a multicolor flip out image. And each neuron arborizes in a specific wedge of the ring with the whole population tiling the structure. So for these experiments, he was looking at the calcium activity of these neurons in a fly that was running on a fly treadmill. And he was expressing G-camp in them. Uh, so this is an example of a still from those experiments, and I'll now play the movie, and you can see what the calcium activity looks like. So you see this bump of activity that moves around the ring, and if you look closely at how the ball's moving, you can see it tracks the ball's movement. So this is tracking the fly's uh, heading over time. Uh, occasionally you'll see the fly stop, and this activity will persist. Um, and so we view this as an internal compass or an internal sense of direction of the fly. This could be that angular heading signal for path integration. So to try to understand it more deeply, we've turned to the literature and specifically to some of these ring attractor models that were developed for head direction cells, as Edward mentioned earlier. So let me just walk you through this briefly. Over the last couple of years, we've done a number of experiments linking the different roles of this ring attractor theories to uh, activity and anatomy in the fly. I'll pull up some of those references from our lab and others at the bottom if you want to look at them further. 
Um, so first off, we have this one ring of neurons from our ring attractor that hold the compass activity. And as was described, you can form this bump through local excitation and long-range inhibition. So we would have our compass neurons holding our representation and inhibitory neurons helping to shape it. But that will just give you a bump. It won't then allow you to update that bump as the animal moves. So for that, let's invoke a second set of neurons. These neurons will receive direct excitation from the original compass ring, so they'll inherit that heading activity. And they'll also receive a second input. This input will now come on as the animal turns in one direction. So let's say the animal turns counterclockwise, the world will now move clockwise. And so you'd want this bump to shift around that direction. So as the animal turns, this second source of input will come in, the overall activity in these neurons will ramp up, and what I haven't told you is there's offset feedback from the second ring back to the original ring. So now as the activity in the red ring ramps, it will pull the activity in the original compass ring over to the right. So we can call these shift right neurons, and similarly you would have shift left neurons. So those are the different types of neurons in this ring attractor model, and the theory, um, we've connected them to uh, our observations of the fly, but you'd imagine that uh, biological inflammation of a ring attractor would probably go beyond what we could imagine at first glance. And so to look to see if there's uh, more detail or more um, functionality in the fly brain than was just suggested in the model, we've turned to a recent data set, which is an entire adult uh, female fruit fly brain that was imaged at the nanoscale resolution using electron microscopy. So this is a data set that was published last year um, by Davi Bach and others at Genelia. Here's an example image from that data set. You can see a bunch of cross-sections of neural processes. And we worked with a team to go in and identify neurons that correspond to these functional roles, to trace out their skeletons, and to look at individual synapses between them. So here you can see some of those different neurons, and I've color-coded them by their functional role. Uh, more recently, we have a second fly brain that's been imaged and has been now automatically reconstructed, and the synapse is automatically identified in a collaboration between Genelia, Fly, EM, and Google. Uh, and that data set's still being proofread, but it's remarkably consistent with this original data set and allows me to tell you about all the neurons in this particular structure, so I'll focus on that from here on out. And here's what that data looks like. So this is a heat map of synaptic counts between different partners. Uh, so this is a pretty good start for starting to characterize our network more deeply um, and down to a very fine level, but uh, it only tells us who's talking to who, it doesn't tell us how. So for that, we've turned to RNA sequencing to, develop, uh, to describe the signs of these connections, to look at the neurotransmitters and receptors and the different partners. And so now what I'll do is for the inhibitory neurons, I'm going to flip positive synapse counts to negative. Um, and this is the uh, matrix or the heat map that results. So there's some interesting complexity here, which I'll get into, but first I'd like to compare it to a theoretical model we developed a couple years ago in collaboration with Hervé Rouault. This is roughly the weight matrix of the model. I've modified a little bit for comparison, but if you excuse me while I block out some quadrants in the actual data, I hope you'll appreciate with me that there's a great similarity between the two. Uh, and this model was able to accurately track a, the heading over time with a simulated bump of activity. So at the very least, it seems like there's the base ring attractor in there, but then with some nice added flavoring. And so what, what, is, what are those additional elements? What are the things that we didn't initially model? Well, if we look at the connections uh, that were proposed, there's a lot of feedback there, but it turns out there's even more feedback than that. Um, we see hyperlocal feedback with uh, pre- and postsynaptic processes very close together, and we think that this may aid in the bump to persisting. So when the animal's in the dark and not moving, we still see that compass. We still see that it, the animal seems to be remembering its heading. Uh, and so we think that's the functional role of this. We also see multiple types of inhibitory neurons. There are uh, structured inhibition that seems to be involved with passing that compass information on and in between neurons. And then there's also more uniform inhibition that's probably involved with things like normalization. Finally, uh, Jonathan Green and Gabby Maiman at Rockefeller had noted that there are multiple shift loops. So I talked to you about the, the left and right shift neurons. There's a whole other set of neurons that looks anatomically very similar. And we know from perturbation experiments that both sets of these are very important for maintaining and updating the bump. And we see clear evidence for them in the EM. They're very different in the connections. And there's, in fact, another type of neurons involved with one of them. So we don't yet understand why you have two of these and why they're so tightly coupled. Um, but we think this is a fascinating avenue of uh, research and we're looking into it further. So I've hopefully now convinced you that we have an angular heading integrator in the fly brain, but what about linear distance integrator integration? We were talking about this homing vector, this path integration. Do we see anything like that? First question is where to look. Um, 
So far, I've told you about the ellipsoid body. That's where that compass activity lives. And this structure, a lot of the neurons in this structure have arborizations as well in the bridge. So the second structure in the brain. And in fact, everything I showed you in the weight matrix has processes here. And so it's the interaction between these two structures, the bridge uh, and the ellipsoid body, that lead to the ring attractor. But there are many other types of neurons that run from the bridge to a third structure called the fan-shaped body. And so it seems likely that that compass information, the heading information, is passed there and potentially combined with other sources of information for further computations. Um, but that limits us to a structure. There are hundreds of different types of neurons there. Where do we start to look? Where do we target um, for distance correlates? So again, we can turn to the electron microscopy data set, and that allows us to sort these different types into input layers, inner or intermediate neurons, and outputs. And we can again plot a weight matrix, or a synaptic count matrix, right? This isn't exactly a weight matrix. Um, and you can see this is just some of the types of neurons in the fan-shaped body. There's lots of interesting structure. If you look at this long enough, you can see some feedback. And this allows us to go through now and identify targeted pathways, feedback loops, et cetera. And I can now do physiology experiments, do calcium imaging of specific types in here and see how the information is transformed. So uh, for the sake of time, I'll just focus on one of these, the input neurons you see there on the upper left. This is a project I've been doing with Hannah Haberkern, another postdoc in the lab. And uh, so if we look at the activity in the fan shaped body, we do see a bump. It tracks the heading, much like I showed you in the opening video. We also see something interesting if we look at the overall activity. So let's just draw a region of interest around everything and see what the fluorescence looks like, so what the calcium activity looks like. We see these fluctuations over time. And if we compare that to the fly's behavior, we see a very tight correlation with that and the forward velocity. And these correlations are high across different flies, trials, whether the animal's in the dark or in a more immersive two-dimensional virtual world. So what you can do with these neurons now is if we read out the fly's position on the ball, um, so that's reading out the behavior directly, we can also now integrate the activity of this population of neurons over time with the position of the activity give us a, giving us the heading and the amplitude giving us the forward velocity. And so we can now compare the measured position to this crudely uh, activity-derived position. And that's what this looks like. So the white dot there is the readout from the ball, and the green dot there is the readout from the activity of this one population of neurons. And you can see that they track quite well. The fly will get a little upset at the bottom, and she'll turn, and then she'll clean herself. And you can see that these changes are picked up as well in the simple integration, the crude integration of this activity. So this seems to give you all the information you would need then for path integration-like computations. We can now drive the animals in position from this internal activity. And so actually right now, and when I return to the lab next week, I'll be continuing to image some of these inner neurons and output neurons um, and look at their calcium activity and see how this information is used. And this, of course, is guided by the EM, which in turn is uh, informed by RNA sequencing and other techniques to tell us about the signs of these connections. And throughout what we do, we couple it pretty tightly with theory, and we think that this can give us a really deep mechanistic understanding of circuit computations in the fly, and hopefully some of the things we learn about these attractors networks will be broadly applicable to navigation. I think there have already been some nice parallels between species that we've seen this morning. So thank you. I have many other people to thank, and I'd be happy to take your questions. time for some questions for Dan. Uh, hi. Really cool talk. Um, I was wondering if in your RNA-seq data there's any evidence that these neurons might be forming gap junctions, and if that complicates the picture of the weight matrix via synapse count that you um, showed us. Yeah, gap junctions are a big concern. I was working with an undergrad this summer on this data set who was really enthusiastic and really worried about this question. Um, the RNA sequencing data is really clear in terms of what transmitters these different cells express, but in terms of receptors and things like gap junctions, a lot of these genes are expressed sort of uniformly throughout neurons, so it's a little hard to tell exactly what's there. I think we need to do more kind of targeted staining uh, and imaging to look at that specifically. Um, but yes, there are some genetic signatures of gap junctions as well. Um, very nice talk. I was just wondering if um, you had any thoughts on why you would need both an angular in integrator and a distance integrator, and if there are certain situations where you may want to use one versus the other system, or do they combine? Them? Yeah, so the way I set it up was that these were potentially two independent things that were combined, um, but what these neurons seem to do, the ones I showed you in the, the final movie, is actually encode for both, right? It's, you have this heading information, 
Um, and you're just modulating that with forward velocity. So it's not clear that there's a specific distance, distance integrator in there. And my guess would be that what the fly is doing is more kind of keeping track of overall vectors with respect to things. And so it just needs to remember kind of relative positions as it moves forward. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. You can imagine doing computations in many different ways. And so it's not obvious that you would need these two distinct um, things as I set it up. Yeah. We'll take one more quick question. Hey, um, yeah, I think that this stuff is really cool, but I think a lot of the power of the fly comes from your ability to do, um, you know, sophisticated genetic manipulations and then actually see what it does to the ability of the fly to do path integration stuff. And I was wondering if you've done, like, you know, sparse single cell flip out removal of single neurons and seeing if it actually affects in, in any of the system and see if it affects the way of, that the fly can perform path integration like tasks or navigation tasks. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, we have a bunch of data where we've um, both looked at the activity as we flock the outputs of these various types of neurons and seen what happens to the bump and we can see we can get rid of it, we can make it less stable. Um, you're asking specifically about behavior. Um, we do see that if we, so flies really love stripes. Um, so if you put a fly on a ball and have it track a, track a stripe, it'll keep it at one specific position. Um, and so this is mainly work from other labs, we've seen in our lab as well, that if you have an intact compass, they'll keep it over here, over there, or behind themselves continuously. As soon as you remove their compass, they seem to keep it roughly directly in front of them. And so it seems like there's some parallel information going on where there's some kind of phototaxis behavior where they can keep it in front of them innately, but then they can use this compass to give it an arbitrary offset. And we're actively trying to do perturbation for this kind of path integration experiment right now to see if these different neurons affect that behavior as well, the local search behavior I showed at the beginning. Yeah, okay. Let's thank Dan again for a fantastic talk.